Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor is a neuroanatomist. In 1996, she was doing research at Harvard and serving as the youngest person ever elected to the board of NAMI, the National Association of Mental Illness. Yep, Dr. Taylor was just your average super achiever. But that year, at 37 years old, she had a massive stroke. She lost movement, language, and her relationship with reality. But what she gained may have even been more profound. Over the next 11 years, she was able to completely heal her brain using both what she knew about neuroscience and what she had come to know because of the stroke, how to use her brain circuitry to feel peace and even euphoria under any circumstance. The book she wrote about her recovery, My Stroke of Insight, is climbing up the New York Times bestseller list. This year alone, Dr. Taylor has been a speaker at TED, a guest on Oprah, and was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. Do you ever wonder when you get up in the morning, you're brushing your teeth and you're looking at yourself, how is it you know what your name is? Who am I? It's because your brain is reminding you and giving you all of this information. But as soon as that goes offline, you're still you, or are you? When I lost all of my memories and all of my relationships in the external world, I shifted away from being who she was. And although I looked like her and I was still in this body and I, I would eventually speak like her and recover, what I, I wasn't recovering her memories or her values or her relationships, so was I really her? And because I was no longer the cells in my brain that said defined the boundaries of where I began and where I ended, I felt that I was as big as the universe, and it was a beautiful experience for me, and I liked it there, and I wasn't necessarily motivated to want to re-engage with an external world that felt like pure pain and chaos. Has it come back? who you were before, and all of those pressures to identify and name yourself and your job and all of those outside factors? The person I was before she died that day, the, her, her interests, her cares, her world, her memories, she died that day. I have regained all of her function. I have regained the ability to speak, the ability to, to create a, a job, to create, actually I grew up to be a neuroanatomist again, who knew? It was not my intention. I, I really, at the time, had no perception that I would ever be able to recover enough of my mind in order to be able to function at that level again. Can you describe how the right and left hemispheres function differently from each other? Our right hemisphere looks at the big picture of everything. You go to the ocean and you look out and you, you experience the vastness, the big picture. Then the left hemisphere takes that big picture and starts picking it apart into the details and the details. And now you're looking at the white caps and you're looking at the kinds of clouds and you're looking at the types of birds and, and you're, you're taking that big beautiful picture and making those distinctions. So the left hemisphere is the ability to take those details so that we can then communicate with it with one another in the external world. So now I can talk to you at the shore about the kinds of birds and, and we can make the sounds and we can talk about the clouds and we can talk about the weather or we can go in the right hemisphere and have the experience of the bigger picture. In one of the early chapters of your book you talk about how 99% or more of our genetic material is similar to each other. Why do we spend so much time focused on our differences? You know, we have this tiny little group of cells in our left hemisphere that says, I am. And as soon as it says, I am, I become a single individual, solid, separate from you. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at our differences instead of our similarities. And we give so much power to that because it has language. And it's talking to us. And it's saying, hey, I'm separate from her. She looks different from me. But the two hemispheres, the right hemisphere, is looking at the similarities. And it's looking for what do we share in common. And it recognizes that we're just energy. We're just all these beautiful cellular, we're, we're cellular entity. We are one human family. You're on a mission, it seems like, to get people there. Why? We're not in a balanced brain society. We're spending most of our time in our left hemisphere, which brings us our stress. As soon as we have stress and we're on the clock, we're urgency, we're about the past, we're about the future, we're not about the present moment, we're missing the present moment, and the present moment is where our joy is. My point is that we are wired for both. And all I'm looking for is a balanced brain model for us as humanity to get on a track where we can really consciously choose who and how we want to be. Binary logic. Intuiting or sensing? Intuiting. Why? Bigger picture. Doctors or nurses? Ooh. 
Nurses. Like care. Yin or yang? Yin. Why? Yin's feminine, soft, gentle, connective. What would you have chosen 11 years ago? Yang. <laughs> yeah. Freud or Jung? Jung. Why? Jung is, uh, I think, more on, more right on in thinking, generalized, just the, the breakdown of how he looked at the brain. Um, I think Freud did some serious damage to um, how we perceive the mentally ill, especially. Teaching or learning? I'm going to say teaching. Why? Because in order to teach, you have to learn your material very well. Einstein or Gandhi? Mmm. Gandhi. Why? Well, again, collective. I think you have to have the collective before you have the detail. Mob logic yeah. or managed health care? Oh, mob logic. <laughs> Collective again. <laughs>